Our next speaker, Stephen Webster, is going to talk to us a little bit more along this same line of athletes and wearable technology. Stephen has a long, varied background in wearable technology, and right now, he would like for you to meet a sensei. So good morning. I understand that the audio is perhaps not so great at the back of the room, so if you can't hear me, please just put your hand up. If you can't understand me, I'm speaking Scottish, so you'll just have to listen a little faster. So I'm going to talk to you today about connected coaching. So I think we're all quite familiar uh, with the connected fitness category. Who rec recognizes the logos up on the slide here? So when I think about connected fitness, and Under Armour kind of named and framed this category. But when I think about connected fitness, I think all the way back to, to Nike Plus foot pods, to uh, Fitbit you know, activity trackers. Um, we then looked at things like uh, you know, watches, the Apple Watch, the Samsung Galaxy Gear. And there's life left in the connected fitness category for sure. We're seeing you know, companies with value, you know, three or four billion dollar valuation companies like Peloton, um, and all manner of, you know, tonal and mirror and all manner of connected fitness equipment. So I don't think the connected fitness category is going anywhere. But what I do think is that uh, technology and the enabling technologies for us to actually coach athletes in skill acquisition and teach you a sport, um, that future is now. And that's a future that we like to call connected coaching. So my team and I that started Ascensi, we're technologists, but we're also sports coaches. We've all coached sport before. So when we thought about the connected coaching category, we tried to take a coach first and a sport first approach to what we would need to develop rather than a technology first. We all know the phrase, when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I, you know, I think when I see a lot of sports technologies, it's I've got a sensor and I've done something with it, now where can I apply that technology? And we tried to take the, 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 the sort of athlete-centered approach to this. So there's, there's five um, principles, if you like, that when we're, when we're coaching athletes, irrespective of technology, or even when we're coaching coaches, uh, these are things that we think about that we're, we're, we're not delivering a great coaching experience unless we're laddering up to these traits. And so I'm going to talk about some of these, but not all of these today, and what technologies enable us to deliver a coaching experience. But before I do that, let me put all of these in context and let me just spend a few moments introducing you to our product and I'd like you to meet Ascensi. Today, let's focus purely on form. Face the bag with chin down and hands up. Straighten your leg and lift your heart. Meet a sensei, your personal trainer who knows your every move. Keep your chin up and eyes to the horizon. Nice, that's good form. With sensors throughout your clothing, she tracks your posture and movement and gives you feedback on form and progress all delivered in real time in your ear. Your handwork is improving. Now let's add a roundhouse. She is trained by experts to help you excel. Drive more with your legs. You will feel less strain on your arms. Much better. You got this. Engage your core and lengthen your spine. Cobra. I'll let you finish watching that video at Ascensi.com. Um, does anybody here uh, row or go to the gym or do CrossFit? How many people participate? So you guys can try Ascensi um, for yourself. Uh, you can download the app for free and uh, we can give you six weeks of rowing coaching uh, with an Olympian. So we launched that product uh, just in October uh, of last year. So I'm gonna talk about three of the principles today. Miss nothing, finding the right words, and coaches watching athletes. So let's just get into it. So um, motion capture and the use of motion capture technology is something that's been around for, for quite a while with elite athletes and Olympic athletes. Uh, this is a video from Red Bull Project X of the US Olympian Lolo Jones. Uh, and they were using very expensive uh, Vicon camera systems, reflective markers, much like you would see uh, Hollywood actors animating King Kong or Gollum. Um, 
And using those reflective markers to look at the biomechanics of the athlete, then we have, kind of to Jesse's point just a few moments ago, yeah, teams of sports scientists and data scientists and coaches analyzing that data and trying to find those marginal gains for the athlete. So for Lolo Jones, they, they managed to find one hundredth of a second uh, in, in, in her uh, distance across the track and she qualified for the London 2012 Olympics by one hundredth of a second. So for elite athletes, if we can use this kind of technology to find these marginal gains, the first question we asked ourselves at Ascensi is how can we consumerize that technology? Um, I don't believe you can coach an athlete by counting their steps or by oscillations on their wrist. As a coach, I have to watch the athlete's whole body. And I'm not looking at the golf club, I'm not looking at the baseball bat, I'm not looking at the ball. I'm looking at the player, I'm looking at the athlete. So we need to be able to see the athlete, watch the athlete on behalf of the coach, and most importantly, miss nothing. So this is a technology we call kinetic capture. This is kind of what a sense he sees, is this stop frame motion. Hundreds of times a second, we're seeing the skeleton of the athlete, we're seeing the posture of the athlete, and recognizing that posture, and able to make decisions about is that correct posture, is that incorrect posture, is the timing right, is the technique correct? And, and this is a series of uh, small, low power, low cost sensors that can be embedded directly into sports apparel. So we're not bringing sports apparel to market, we're licensing this technology to the sports apparel providers that you would rather wear. Um, so we can upgrade that apparel as smart apparel that can be used to coach you in the sport of your choice. So, as I, as I alluded to earlier, we've started focusing on the sport of rowing. And we're very lucky to have a two times Olympic gold medalist, one of the top female rowers in the world, uh, Helen Glover, on our, on our advisory board for the company. And Helen uh, recently gave a talk uh, at University of Oxford last year uh, to, to the students there. And I'm going to share a few snippets from that talk today. The whole talk is online and it's a fantastic talk. But I want to share a few snippets today. Uh, and in this next piece, Helen's going to talk about the importance of technique uh, in training. Because it is so hard to train on your own, but it gives you the opportunity to do what's best for you. And I would say time invested in technique is time really, really well spent. So for me, if the other girls were doing, in, the other girls in my training group were doing maybe a 12K row and I didn't have that time, I had to rush off to school, I would do a 6K row and spend the rest of the time working on my technique. Um, I think that pays huge dividends, especially if you're fairly new to a, sp new to a sport. Um, you, can, you can line up on the start line with somebody as fit as you, and you can, you can beat them by length if your technique is better. So I think that's a really important insight that, that transcends sports, uh, that focus on technique uh, is really critical. And to, to improve technique, as I say, we need to be able to look at athletes' posture uh, and movement. So when I think about, um, you know, I think it's really incumbent on us as we start looking at connected coaching to be very distinct and very deliberate about what the differences are between connected fitness uh, and connected coaching. So let me lay out some of these today as well. So in connected fitness, you know, over the last several years, we've seen a lot of heart rate monitors, embedded heart rate monitors, um, you know, measuring muscle activity, uh, a real focus on biometrics, what's going on inside the body, which is really insightful for understanding performance. But when you're trying to improve the discipline of practice, when you're trying to help people acquire skill and teach technique and take someone through a teaching syllabus, it's much more important that we're looking from the outside in. It's much more important that we're looking at biomechanics. So I think that's a key trend we're gonna see as we shift uh, the connected fitness category into connected coaching, is much more attention to biomechanics, whether that's sensors and clothing, or we're seeing incredible advances in computer vision with ordinary uh, cell phone cameras, and that's definitely a strategy for some sports as well. I think we see a shift away from the sensors being on the watches to the sensors being in apparel, as I said. Um, and I think a really fundamental importance is today we really focus on measuring effort. We focus on measuring outputs. We look at um, things like our watts or our calories or our steps or our distance or the altitude that we climbed. We're looking at all of the outputs that are a consequence of our practice. For connected coaching, it's time to start looking at what goes into our practice. And that's much harder. That's much less trivial. Um, it's not necessarily quantified. So how do we measure and think about um, the quantification of practice so that a machine can make decisions about whether we should be moving forward in our practice, whether we should be staying where we are and reinforcing our practice, whether we should be periodizing our practice. So I think these are some of the shifts for Miss Nothing. 
So I talked about find the right words. We all know the phrase, if you see something, you should say something. And that's really, you know, that's coaching in a nutshell. If you see an athlete, if you watch an athlete performing, you'll see a number of things, a number of opportunities for improvement. But now you need to decide what you're going to say. So my background in coaching is in martial arts and jiu-jitsu and karate. And if you come into my, my school as a white belt, I'm not going to coach you like a black belt. I'm not going to hold you to that same standard. So how do I make decisions about what I'm going to coach? How do I make decisions about how I'm going to explain that to you? Um, you know, I, I think a lot of the technologies we see today, it's like your personal best is 1 minute 30. Let's go for 1 minute 28. We, ju we just throw out these utterances that aren't really helpful. And if you've ever worked with a great coach, they have an ability to communicate with you. You know, I often said to the coaches that I taught, your job is to take your technique and attach it to your student's body. And it's, it's the use of metaphor. It's the use of uh, different learning styles. And I've got another clip from Helen. Uh, Helen's coach, Helen was part of Team Great Britain in London and Rio. And her coach, Robin Williams, is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal coach. And she speaks incredibly fondly about him. And I want to share another short anecdote there. And our coach, Robin, was, was amazing at that. So Robin is, if you think of Robin, you kind of don't really think of him as a coach. You think of him as more of an artist. He's so, you know, he kind of conjures up an image of rowing, which if you walk past him having a conversation, you wouldn't even know he was talking about rowing. He's so descriptive in his language. Um, and we used to get, people used to take the mickey out of us quite a lot because we would be talking about things about like, pole vaulting past the catch and and um, you know the, the boys always used to laugh at us but I do remember one particular particular session where we had done well and we had beaten the boys on one of the pieces and they came up and they said oh how did you do this and we said well you know we were, we were putting our blade in past the white picket fence and pushing it past the uh and they were like what <laughs> oh right yeah I get it so, so the way he the way he describes kind of the stroke is is kind of really really unique so I think in any, any of the times that we plateaued he would suddenly turn around and describe it a totally different way. And he would sort of try something totally different. And next thing you know, we were kind of doing pauses in the boat with him throwing tennis balls at us and trying to catch it. <laughs> so a lot of it was about refreshing and changing things up every time it was a little bit. Um, but what she's talking about there is the use of metaphor, the use of analogy. So in rowing, the catch is when you're right at the front of the boat and all that weight of the water is in the oars. And now you have to get your body and get the momentum going in the oars. And he compares that to pole vaulting. And suddenly with pole vaulting, you kind of get a sense of digging in and then letting go and just being able to use that metaphor is these things can, that can just unblock an athlete like ah now I understand we have very poor proprioception I, I would often when I'm teaching karate say okay everybody left foot forward no your other left foot forward we don't even know our left from our right when we're unfamiliar with the sport we're trying to practice so it's really important that we're constantly trying to find the right way to communicate and engage with the athlete so when I think about finding the right words, this is like we've got to, I often say teaching isn't tracking and, and, and counting isn't coaching and cheering isn't coaching. We have to move beyond, you know, these, these shout outs on our Peloton bike or these cheers on our headphones as we have one mile to go on our run. That's great, that's motivational, it's encouraging, it gives us validation, it makes us feel good, but it doesn't make us better at the sport. And so we need to move beyond counting to really thinking about how can we deliver effective coaching cues, seeing the, and often a coaching cue isn't just seeing when someone does something wrong and telling them they're doing it wrong. That's actually pretty bad coaching. It's as important that fifth or sixth time you see the athlete try to do something and they get it right, that's when you anchor it. That's when you say, did you feel that? Did you feel how your feet were solid in the floor and therefore blah, blah? So when you anchor that good movement, you can then use that cue again to, to remind the athlete. So this is very different from just you know, throwing out a count or counting reps. And similarly, moving away from just encouraging and motivating the athlete to actually educating them, actually trying to transfer technique to them. Um, again, uh, I often say that the, the very best imaginable coaching experience is this voice in your ear, as you saw in our video, is just going to say, eyes to the horizon, sit up tall. And the machine learning and the expert system and the sensors and all that magic that's happening under the covers with your smart apparel, the athlete never needs to know about that. All they need to hear is eyes to the horizon, sit up tall. And now you've made them a better athlete again. So finally, I want to talk about coaches watch athletes. So come on, own up. Who owned the Jane Fonda workout video sometime in the, in the 80s? Oh, suddenly everybody puts their coffee on the floor and one person admitted it. 
So, uh, so this, this was like the first workout video, a huge success, New York Times bestseller. And frankly, when we look at workout apps, go and, if anyone has a workout app on their phone right now, pull it out, and it's not very dissimilar to this. I even have a suspicion it's filmed in the same New York studio with the three arched windows and the, and the cement floor. But we really haven't changed anything. Fitness and learning online is about watch a video of a coach, follow along to them in real time as they're doing it, as they're trying to talk while they perform. Someone on the left who's the superstar, so if you're really good, follow this person. And then the person on the right who's like, yeah, if you're really struggling with this, copy this person. So now you have to decide, who am I? Am I Jane Fonda? Am I the superstar athlete? Or am I the, the beginner athlete? Who will I follow? And have you ever tried doing yoga looking at the floor when you're supposed to be looking at your TV? It's just not the right way around. And this is broken because um, we shouldn't have athletes, sorry, we shouldn't have athletes watching coaches trying to teach themselves. We need to invert this so once again coaches are watching athletes and offering guidance and offering correction. And when you follow along to your videos online, they're not watching you. I'll often sit on the Peloton bike reading TechCrunch. And you know, the, the coach is telling me to turn the resistance up to 80 or to stand up out of the seat. And I'm sitting down and I'm reading TechCrunch, but I still get the cheer, I still get the motivation. And I think you know, for teaching sports skills, we need to move beyond that. All right, everybody turn and watch me. Actually, I wanna go back one just here. So I'm about to show, I don't think there isn't a role for watching a coach. I'm gonna show you a little vignette of the Ascensi experience if you roll. What you're gonna see here is Johan, one of the coaches on our platform, Johan is going to teach a drill. So if we've, if we've been watching you rowing, and as we watch you, we see that your stroke sequence is wrong in the second half of the stroke, once you're at the back of the rowing machine or the back of the boat, all the way to the front, there's a drill that coaches like to use called a pause at finish drill. So I'm gonna let Johan teach the drill, and then I'm gonna show you a sensei taking someone through that drill. All right, everybody turn and watch me. One of the best pieces of advice a coach gave me is good form is free speed. I'm going to give you guys some good form. So we're going to start off by doing a drill. It's called the pause at finish drill. Let's grab onto the handle. We're going to sit here. This is called the finish position. First thing, let's just notice, legs should be flat, shoulders are down, elbows are back, almost as if you're going to elbow somebody behind you. First thing we're going to do is have our arms go away. My arms are away, my shoulders are still loose, my legs are still flat. Next, I'm going to lean forward. Body forward. So there's three steps to this drill. Angle, leaning forward. And the last one. I'm going to pause it and I'll just explain it a little more quickly. So there's three steps to the drill. Your arms go away. Then only once your arms have correctly gone away and you haven't moved anything else, then you rock your body forward. And only once you've hinged at the hip and moved your body forward, are you allowed to then bend your legs and return. That's the efficient, correct uh, stroke technique. So what you're about to see next is one of my team, Bill, wearing a sensei, wearing the sensors. It's quite an old video, so you'll see some of the sensors just wrapped around his wrist, not in his clothing. And you'll see a sensei watching Bill. Now, what I want you to understand here, he is not following along to what a sensei is saying. A sensei is giving him the next coaching cue only when she sees him in the correct posture from that previous moment. Single stroke, arms away, body over, and roll. So each time he hits that posture, he gets the next coach. Arms away, body over, and roll. And on the next one, he'll pause. Arms away, body over, and roll. And only when he hits that posture does he get coached through. So it's now just like having a coach over your shoulder talking you through that technique and correcting you if you're wrong um, and anchoring if you're right. The next video I want to show you is just a yoga instructor uh, practicing for her teacher training. Um, and what you're going to see is in one of these poses, she's going to let her hip turn. You'll see her back foot kind of lift slightly. And then a sensei will come in with a coaching cue. She knows what she should be doing. We, in coaching, we call that conscious competence. If she thinks about it, she can do it. But we need to shift the skill from conscious competence into her unconscious competence. She can do it without thinking about it. And you're going to see a sensei give her that nudge, give her that reminder, and give her that correction. Take all your weight into your front foot and lift your left leg up behind you. Drop your left hip, toes pointing down. So because we see that leg rotated, because we see that hip opening, because we see that hip lifting, we can just deliver that cue that she knows already uh, to correct that warrior three posture. Whoops. So I was sat around. 
So one last clip from Helen. So I, I want to finish by talking again and just reinforcing the opportunity here in focusing on practice. And I want to share this anecdote to finish. So I was sat around on a training camp and I was probably a little bit bored, but I decided to work out how many practice strokes we take in training. And I worked out that in an Olympic cycle, I take about 4 million practice strokes, which means that when we get to an Olympic final, for every single stroke, I've taken well over 16,000 practice strokes. And I think for me that really highlighted the importance of the quality of that practice. It's not just being out there and it's not just taking those strokes. It's making sure I'm doing the right thing and I'm having the right learning during training um, to make sure I'm ready to perform each one of those single strokes that are so important in the Olympic final. So just think about that. For every stroke she takes in a, in a race or in an Olympic final, there were 16,000 strokes in practice. And so it, it really stresses that like, there's so many technologies, so many products that are allowing us to watch our performance, but that's one stroke for every 16,000 that we make in practice. So we think for Connected Coaching, the opportunity is for all of us, whether we're practicing alone, whether we're practicing in a group setting where we get limited attention span from the coach, every single stroke, every step, every throw, every posture, every pose can be guided, monitored, and corrected uh, by uh, sensor-enabled clothing and intelligent digital assistance. So that's what we're delivering with Ascensi. We're really excited to make it available to you. Um, there's my contact details. I love hearing from people who have ideas for how we could use the product or people who want to unlock their own athletic potential. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show.